Uh, Viva, 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 Andre, Andre, Viva! Uh, functions. Well, functions are basically special types of equations, which for every one input, there is exactly one output. Um, in terms of evaluating functions, if I wanted to evaluate a function at a particular value, like, for example, uh, this function f, if I wanted to find this when x was equal to 0, what the value for f of x or the output of that function was, um, there's a special notation for that. So I'm going to take the function f, and everywhere, every this parentheses here represented the value x. So to help me evaluate functions, I'm going to go, and everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put those parentheses there. So this will be parentheses squared minus 5 sine of I see an x, so there's a parentheses, plus 5 to the exponent of those parentheses. Now, if I wanted to evaluate this when x was equal to 0, I would take 0 and replace x with 0 everywhere in that equation. So I had an x here, I'm going to replace that with 0. I had an x here, I'm going to replace that with 0. I had an x here, I'm going to replace that with 0. So then I just do some basic algebra to evaluate that. Uh, 0 squared is 0 minus 5 times sine of 0 is also 0, plus 5 to the 0 power. Anything to the 0 power is just 1, so this is 0 minus 0 plus 1. So this entire function is equal to 1 when x is 0. Okay, so let's talk about domain and range of a function. The domain is basically all possible inputs of a function. So when I have a function listed like, um, let's say, f of x, equals 3x, it's a linear function. Uh, all possible inputs is what I'm putting into it, which would be my x values here. I plug in an x value, and then this is the output value I would get. So these are my x values in this case. All possible outputs of the function is what I get after I plug that value in. So that would be 3 times that value, which is represented by this f of x value. When we're graphing these, the input value is usually the independent axis or the x-axis, and the output value is basically the y-axis when graphing. Uh, so uh, we're not going to focus too much on range on the final exam. You should be aware of range, that, that what the output values are, but it will uh, finding particular domains is what we'll focus on. Um, so we should be able to know what, how to find the domain of uh, these three different given functions. Now, the basic restrictions for domain is that... Um, I the, uh, the numbers I plug in for x have to give me real numbers, so I have to get real numbers out of this. Um, so the two cases where that wouldn't happen is if I get an imaginary number or an undefined value, an undefined number. So let's look at the first function, f, and see if we can figure out its domain. I have a square root, and square roots give me imaginary numbers whenever the stuff inside them is negative. So since I need real numbers, the stuff that's inside that square root, 5x minus 10, has to be positive or equal to zero, because if it was a negative number, I'd get uh, imaginary solutions for this, which I can't have. I want real numbers only. So I solve this inequality. I get 5x minus 10. Sorry, 5x is greater than or equal to 10 when I add 10 to both sides. Divide both sides by 5, and I get x is greater than or equal to 2. So the domain of f in this case will be all numbers from and including 2, it's a closed bracket, up to infinity. So there's my domain. For g of x, I'm going to go through a similar process, ask when I get real numbers. I don't have any square roots, so I don't have to worry about an imaginaries. But I do have a fraction, and a fraction will be undefined when this denominator is 0. So let's figure out what value of x makes that denominator 0. 2x plus 3 equals 0 will happen when 2x equals negative 3, or when x is negative 3 halves. So that tells me that uh, I cannot have the value x equals negative 3 halves in my domain because that would make this undefined. So I can represent that by saying all values of x such that x does not equal negative 3 halves. So I can allow any number for x except for negative 3 halves. Finally, the last function, h of x here, is a double whammy situation. I have restrictions coming from the square root, and since it's a fraction, my denominator can also not be 0. So I don't want 0 in the denominator, and my values for the square root have to be greater than or equal to 0. So let's consider those two restrictions separately. First, um, for my numerator, the square root of x, everything in that square root, which is just x, has to be greater than or equal to 0. So that's restriction number one. 
Restriction number two is this denominator cannot equal zero. So let's figure out, just like we did here, when it is equal to zero. x squared minus 3x equals zero. Well, there's a common factor of x. So I'm left with x minus 3 equals zero. So this denominator will be undefined whenever x is zero or x is three. So my domain for my two restrictions are x is greater than or equal to zero, and since my denominator is zero in these two cases, x cannot be zero or three. So I'm going to sum that up in my domain. So it can be any value greater than or equal to zero here, but from this restriction it can equal zero, so it's going to be starting at zero going up to the number 3, not including it, and then any number after 3, 3 to infinity. I'd also accept if you wrote this as the domain being all numbers from 0 to infinity, not including 0, and x cannot equal 3. These are two equivalent ways of representing that domain but just make sure that you account for both restrictions. X is greater than or equal to zero, but because of that second restriction, where X is not zero, I'm not including that equals part, because that second restriction removes it. And then also X cannot be three. So it's pretty much every number between zero and three and three to infinity. Oh my goo, you got it again. Graphing functions. Um, in order to graph functions, you should be aware of what all the parent functions. The complete list of all the parent functions you should be aware of can be found on the inside front cover of your textbook. That's also including trig graphs. Um, for each of those parent functions, you should know uh, how to find their domain and their range, or be aware what their domain and range are, uh, what the graph or the behavior of that parent function looks like. Um, it Does it have an asymptote? So asymptotes, recall, are basically values that the graph becomes arbitrarily close to, but never actually equals. So for this graph, um, f of x equals 1 over x minus 1, it has two asymptotes. It has, this graph gets arbitrarily close to, in the x direction, x equals 1, the vertical line x equals 1, is one of its asymptotes, and the reason is, uh, that is actually where this graph will be undefined. So since x equals 1 is not in its domain, there is no actual function value at this point, and the behavior of the graph, it gets arbitrarily close to it at either end, but never actually equals it. And the other asymptote is down here along the x-axis, and the equation for the x-axis is y equals 0, because the value for y is 0 all along the x-axis. Uh, the reason for that is, if you notice in this graph, my numerator is 1, so I'll never get a value for 0 in the numerator, therefore my output can never equal 0. Okay, so asymptotes. Um, the other types of graphs that have asymptotes you should be familiar with are exponential and log functions, which we'll review uh, later on. Um, symmetry. Uh, symmetry is basically, if the graph is, kind of has a mirror image, uh, notice that this graph down here, the absolute value function, is symmetric along this vertical line. All the points along this side have a mirror image along this side, so this has what's called an axis of symmetry. Come on, axis of symmetry at the line x equals 4, the vertical line x equals 4, everything on this side of the graph is symmetric on this side of the graph. Uh, other types of symmetry you could see are point symmetry, and uh, there's two special kinds of symmetry that result in what are called even and odd functions. An odd function is one that's symmetric through the origin point, that has a point symmetry. Uh, this graph x cubed is symmetric through this point. Every graph here, if I do a mirror through this point has a symmetric point on the opposite side. So it's it kind of looks like this entire quadrant flipped over the origin into this entire quadrant. That's how the graph would show up. Um, if uh, you want an algebraic way for testing for symmetry, the formula for odd symmetry is f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. So an example of how to apply that would be um, 
say f of x equals x cubed minus x. Well, if I was going to check this algebraically, I'm going to plug in negative x into this function and see if I get back negative my original function. So f of negative x is equal to negative x cubed, which would be negative x cubed, minus negative x. Well, two negatives make a positive, so that will be plus x. Notice that if I multiply this original function by a negative, I get this function. So negative f of negative x equals negative f of x, so this would be an odd function. Even functions also have symmetry, but they are not symmetric through the origin. They are symmetric through the y-axis. So every point on this side of the graph has a symmetric point matched on the other side of the graph. It's a mirror image. Um, to check odd, even functions algebraically, the f of negative x actually gives you back the exact same original function. So you could check it the same way. If you get back the original function, it's an even function. Uh, two other types of even and odd functions you should be familiar with. Another odd function is the sine function um, and also the tangent function. And an even function is the cosine function. Now, graphing functions with transformations. These are the four basic transformations you should be familiar with. Uh, we have horizontal and vertical shifts as well as horizontal and vertical reflections. So when I'm adding values in onto x values before evaluating the function, that is a shift left. If this was x minus c, that would be a shift right, the opposite direction. When I add values onto the function value, that's a shift upwards. Reflections, when I'm negating inside the function, that's a reflection across the y-axis, which would be and the reason is when I negate all my x values, this positive 5, like say I take the point uh, 5, 0, and I reflect it through the y-axis, I'd get the point negative 5, 0. So that's why when I multiply my x values by a negative, it's reflecting through the y-axis. When I multiply the function value by a negative, it's reflecting through the x-axis this way. <coughs> so how do you apply these shifts? Well, uh, say I wanted to graph this function g of x equals negative square root of x minus 3 plus 5. Uh, I can relate this back to my original parent function. Um, at here, f of x equals the square root of x. So what this basically looks like is f. Now notice I'm subtracting 3 from the x, so that would be x minus 3. Okay, so f of x is the square root, so that'll be square root of x minus 3. I then have a negative times that, so I have a negative times that value, and I'm adding 5 onto the end. Okay, so you can think of this in terms of this original parent function. So how these shifts work is that I'm subtracting 3, so that's going to be a shift, um, not left in this case because it's negative, so it'll be a shift right 3 units. So what will happen to this graph is that it will, this original parent graph, will move over three units to here. Then, after I've shifted it, the next thing I do is reflect it. So this graph will be then flipped over. Flipped over the axis. And then I take all of those values and I add five to them. So then it's moved up five units. So that is what my graph will end up looking like. So if I do a sketch of it to the side here, that's a horrible line. Let's try to make that a little bit straighter. My overall graph is being moved to the right three units first. Now, I, I would, when accounting for this, it's basically pretend you're x and you're um, accounting for each of these transformations as they're applied to you. So the first transformation being applied to me as x is I'm moving myself to the right three units. So my graph moved st from my starting point, which is here, over to the right three units. So from the starting point over to the right three units. Then I reflected. So I know my graph's now going to go down this way. And I moved up five. So I'm up here, and my graph's reflected. So there's my graph of g of x. It's what it would look like if it was graphed. The last thing you should be aware of is uh, how to determine whether or not something is a function. We have this vertical line test to determine if the graph is a function. 
Um, recall the definition is that for each input, it has exactly one output. So as I drag a vertical line, that's looking at all of my possible input values, which is all the values along the x-axis. As I move along those x-axis values, I can see where my y output values are. So for example, if I scroll over here to x equals negative 1, my output value in the y direction is negative 8. So for each of these vertical lines, I can see that I have one um, input. Uh, for each input, I have one output value. So as I drag this along, I have one output for each input. So this passes the vertical line test because I have it, it's only intersecting the graph at one point. So this is a pass. Intersects at one point only. Whereas if I look at the second one, as I drag this vertical line through here, notice that I'm intersecting this at two different points. So this fails my vertical line test. So this is a uh, fail because it intersects at two different points. So if it's a pass, this is a function. Yes, this is a function. If it fails, it's not a function. So no, not a function.